Let's look ahead to Saturday in the NBA. There are six games on. We're going to look at some streaming options, some injury injury updates. You know how it goes on one of these shows. Michael Bolton, he also knows. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I could really go for a grimace shake right now. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball, and on Instagram at LockedOnFantasyBasketball. Today's episode is brought to you by PricePix, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to PricePix.com slash LockedOnNBA and use the code all lowercase LockedOnNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. We are available on all platforms. Be a double banger. If you were listening on audio, come check out my beautiful Nike t-shirt, 1980s retro design on YouTube. You can see my head. You can see other bits, maybe. Who knows? That's for later on. If you are on video, download the audio. Download it. Make sure you download it. Let it play through and just help out. Thumbs up. Subscribe. We're hitting to the end of the new year. If you haven't given me a Christmas gift yet, this is a great way to do it. We're here to talk about Saturday's action in the NBA. As I said, only six games on, but early. There's an early one. It starts at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, So, yeah, be aware of that. Get ready to uh, make your lineup adjustments. There's a 5 p.m. game and a 6 p.m. game. And the the late game is 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Oh, wow. Really early day tomorrow. Don't know why. Don't know why. But anyway, that's where we're at. So, be aware. Locked on Fantasy Basketball Bowl. Your second waiver time is going to change as it always does on the early games. And everyone else, get your lineups ready. 9 a.m. start here in Australia. That's cool. All right, let's talk what we need to talk about injury news across these games. Monte Morris remains out for the, um, who are they called? Yeah, the Detroit Pistons. He's out. Old mate, injury legend, illness legend, Christian Coloco remains out for the Raptors. Um, Jericho Sims and Mitchell Robinson are going to be out. For the Knicks, Isaiah Stewart, we actually got that news today, so maybe the Pistons will win a game. He's out for 10 to 14 days with that toe sprain. Um, Just, I'm not going to talk about Isaiah Stewart anymore today, but if you haven't... Get that garbage out of here! Yeah, you don't need to be holding on to Isaiah Stewart. He's done. Would they continue to start Kevin Knox? Maybe. People, uh, I talked about this yesterday, they love complaining about the Asar Thompson stuff. The shooting is a real problem. Um, and him next to Duran does create a lot of spacing issues, and, and that's an issue. That, that, that is an issue. I, I do get that from from Monty. I wouldn't have played us uh, ten minutes, but him playing thirty a night next to Duran leads to some problems. And we've seen how much having some shooting next to Cade has opened this team up and actually made them more competitive. So yeah, I, that's you know, beside the point. Uh, the big fella in Chicago, um, Nikola Vucevic is going to be out. I'm going to guess that Kyrie is going to be out. Jason Kidd is being all vague about injuries, but he's basically not giving us anything positive on Kyrie. So I'm not going to give you anything positive on Kyrie in terms of a return. I don't think that there's any chance of him playing here. While Maxi Kleber, toe dislocation legend, has been out for months, and we're just going to assume that he remains out. I don't know when he's coming back. It's a long time. I fear that he might be washed. Draymond Green's suspension continues. Still frustrates me that they won't just give an exact number of games. It's really easy to do NBA. He's out for 15 games, and we'll reassess at 15 games whether he is ready to return. Not like, "Eh, we'll see, we'll see. It's ridiculous, ridiculous. Their whole disciplinary section needs to be reworked. Anyway, I thought Gary Payton was going to be out, but he is not. Gary Payton is available, and honestly, I have no idea how it works in the rotation. None. I can't figure it out. Somebody has to be removed. It's not going to be Pajemski. It's not going to be Chris Paul or Steph or Clay or Wiggins. Who's it going to be? It's probably going to have to be Moses Moody, who's been really good this season. Is Peyton actually good enough that he demands 20 minutes a night? I'm not sure that he is. So I think Moody's going to lose all those minutes. I don't think it impacts Pajemski, who has been over this little stretch, their second best player. Since he's been starting, he has been their second best player. 
You could argue Clay Thompson. I would say Pajemski's contributed more on both ends. Clay's had some good shooting nights and bad ones, but I think that's close. So I don't think Pajemski's losing significantly with Peyton coming back. And then does Peyton impact Kaminga and Wiggins? Not really. They play different positions. Jackson Davis, not really. So I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it fits in. Anyway, he's available to play, Caleb Martin. Uh, not Caleb Martin, Gary Payton. The Heat are probably the biggest injury wild card at the moment. I don't think Caleb Martin's going to play. He sprained his ankle on Christmas. He missed the game yesterday. I would expect that he doesn't play. Again, I'm trying to project out. That's what the asterisks, asterisks mean, that I'm trying to project what the injury status will be. I don't know. They haven't released it for Caleb Martin. I don't think that he will play, so I'm listing him currently as doubtful for their game. Jimmy Butler has missed the last four, I think it is, with a calf injury. I'm going to put him questionable. His return, I guess, should be coming. Well, Joshie Richardson has missed a couple with a back issue. I've got no reason to suspect either way on him, so I'm going to put him questionable too. Brucey Brown is dealing with a knee bone bruise, which is obviously not a great thing, which, honestly, that could keep you out a game. It could keep you out two months. It's really hard to know that with Bruce. I think you should be okay dropping Bruce Brown. The question then remains is, does Brown start over Neesmith? Does Brown start over Nempard? Does Brown come off the bench? I would expect he just starts over Nempard, but I don't know. Cam Reddish missed the last game for the Lakers. He was questionable. They started Rui Hachimura in his place. The lineups on the Lakers still make absolutely zero sense, and their rotations continue to make zero sense. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I do think that there is going to be a point this season that Reddish is actually getting DMP'd, because I, I think that eventually you'll find that we need more for Reeves. Russell plays a couple more. And Max Christie just establishes himself as a better player. But I don't know. That's a long way away. If Reddish is out, Christie will get more run. But it's very hard to read too much into that last game against the Hornets because the Hornets were embarrassingly bad, as per usual, when they got smacked. What we know is that the Sixers pair, Nico Batum and Joel Embiid, are out on Friday. I have no idea whether they'll play on Saturday. I will guess that Batum does not. And I think there is a chance that Embiid plays. But I'm not... I'm not massively confident on that. I'm not massively confident on um, on him playing. Um, KJ Martin's also listed questionable. Don't really care. He's not in the rotation. Luka Doncic missed the last game for the Mavericks. Our default status is if someone misses a game without any sort of timeline, they just get defaulted to questionable. I probably should have changed Doncic to probable. I think he missed that game. Just He was limping around. He'd had such a big, big load of, of late. They had a pretty jam-packed schedule as well. I'm pretty sure that was just a sort of rest situation and he will play. That's a guess. And the same goes with Kyle Lowry, who missed the last game for the Heat, but they listed it as soreness. I'd be pretty surprised if soreness pushed through to the next one and that he was out again. So I've upgraded, personally, Kyle Lowry up to probable for the Miami Heat for their game on Saturday. But, of course, there's just a lot of different, um, a lot of different ways to approach that. I don't know that for sure, but if I'm going to go through this, I, I, I'd expect that Martin is out, Lowry is in, and that I don't know about Butler and Richardson, which impacts so much. Jamal Kane, Duncan Robinson, Jaime Huckers, um, Haywood Highsmith, Kevin Love. So many of their players get impacted by all those different statuses. And I, again, I, I don't... If I had to... Again, if I, I'm going to put extra things there. Embiid's probably questionable, doubtful. Batum's probably closer to doubtful. Doncic is probably probable questionable. I would guess, and I've got Lowry probable. God, that just introduces a whole bunch of other stuff, doesn't it? Um, but yeah, that's where I think we're at with that. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, and not coincidentally, it is the easiest and the most exciting way to play DFS. Instead of worrying about salary caps and lineups and pros and sharks and thousands of other people in your contests, all you've got to do is look at individual player projections. You choose between two to six of them. You say more or less on the individual number, and that's it. Bang, Bob's your uncle. You can choose points or threes, rebounds, assists, steals, fantasy points. You can do their combo specials in the specials league where it's a combination between a football player and a basketball player. Example, Travis Kelsey receptions, LeBron James threes, number 10 and a half, you say more or less. And if you get six right out of your two to six entries, you win up to 25 times your money back. 10 bucks to 250. 5 bucks to 125. 100 bucks? Well, 2,500. There you go. That is as simple as it gets over on Price Picks. Payouts are fast. Entries are fast. And it's fun. We all want to have fun. That's what we do this for. Fun, yeah? We want enjoyment in it. 
Go to pricepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. That is pricepicks.com slash locked on NBA. The code is locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Pricepicks is daily fantasy sports made easy. So let's look at the weekend back to back. It's only one team. We've been talking about this all week, the Lakers, and how if you did have D'Angelo Russell and he was struggling, you might want to hold and the value of Torian Prince because they've got this Saturday, Sunday back to back. Now, last game, Russell actually stood back up and played big minutes. I don't know that that's real moving forward. I've got no idea. But the value here is the back to back. And then we'll reassess and see how it all works. Is the, the Darvin Ham did say that LeBron and AD were going to play in both of those games. I was a little surprised. I didn't think that they necessarily would play on a back-to-back with a perpetual... I, I didn't even list that down because we know that LeBron and AD are going to have questionable tags. Jared Vanderbilt's going to have a probable or a questionable tag as well. We know that's going to be the case. But I thought they might not play the Saturday game, or sorry, the Sunday game on New Year's Eve with those perpetual questionable tags. But they're the only team that plays that back-to-back across the weekend. Both of those days are streamable. So your Princes and Russells, if he was dropped, and your Hachimuras, who I don't love as a fantasy guy, obviously, but there's minutes there. Maybe it's Christie. Maybe it's Jackson Hayes, although, God, he's terrible. Maybe it's Christian Wood. But it's really Prince, Hachimura. They're your two guys who are widely available, who get you the double dose bang on the weekend. They're double bangers, just like you guys are, as I'm sure that is true. Let's look at the streams of the day. Always remembering here that if Joel Embiid is out, Paul Reed is up the top here. Actually, he's not. Andre Drummond's ahead of him, but Paul Reed is right there. He is a 12-team stream. I actually added him today in industry pickup. He was available, which is a bit surprising to me, so maybe I get two good games out of him. We'll see. The 10-team stream of the day is the big avocado, Andre Drummond. He is still widely available. Last game, yes, he only played 22 minutes with some foul trouble, but he did have 16 rebounds in that time. You cannot leave Andre Drummond on the waiver wire. This is why you have a streaming spot, and if he takes up your streaming spot for two weeks, it's okay. That's okay. You hold, you deal with it, unless something really good long-term. Usually, again, people ask me this question all the time. Hey, do I go and add... Let's let's assume that it is just a one-more-game thing for Paul Reed. Do I add Paul Reed for one game, or do I keep Andre Drummond, where I might get two weeks out of it? Okay, so is the value of those guys similar enough? Take the longer longer guy. If you think a guy is going to have more value on one game, Ver, like, but 10% more value. Let's say that we thought that Reed was going to be much better than Drummond for one game, but Drummond might give you top 60 numbers for three weeks. You take that top 60 for three weeks. The The tougher thing is, like, if the guy is projected to be 130th, Contavious Caldwell Pope, for the rest of the season, but I can get a one-game top 60 play out of it, I'd be more inclined to do that, to get the top 61 game in and then get the next little run of guys who might have a three-game top 80 window and move on like that. It's hard to completely quantify the way that I approach it. But in general, if there's a relative closeness in the value of the player, take the longer the longer term view of it, how we get the longer value out of it and sacrifice a little bit short term. But if you're talking, well, this guy's going to be 40th for one game and 200 for the rest of the season, but this other guy is 130th, then you take the 40 for one game because you can churn through those other spots in most situations, depending on how your league is set up, all of that stuff. You know, how many moves do you have? What's your roster size? Uh, you know how it all works, right? But the the general rule that I will have is, if they're close, go for more. Even if they're slightly less on the one game value, if they're close, you go for longer term value. If the gap is wider, then you can go more shorter term. Anyway, Andre Drummond, 10-team cat league. 12-teamer is the rabbit hunter, Alex Caruso. He's still widely available. He shouldn't be. You can drop him when he gets hurt, but he's actually on a little run here of playing. He's really, really important. The 14 teamer, Derek Jones is 20% available, or 20% rostered, 80% available. Yeah, I know things might change when Kyrie returns, but you know who's not returning yet? Kyrie. And you know who's starting? Derek Jones. And you know who's putting up top 110, top 100 numbers? Derek Jones. So why is it that he's just widely available everywhere? Like everywhere. Not everywhere, but 20% rostered only. And then the 16 teamer, like... I'm not a massive fan of what the Giggle has been doing this season, Alec Burks. But he's 3% rostered. They're closing games with him. He's playing 26 minutes a night. And you can't tell me if you're in a 16-team league that you can't have some use in that. And there's no way that only 3% of leagues are 16-teamers or deeper. There's not. He is just everywhere. Like he is, You could consider him. I wouldn't. But if you're in a 14-team league or a 12-team league, you want to get desperate. You could even consider him a stream given the minutes they're currently using Alec Burks. Again, this is not a long-term thing for the Giggler. He should be traded off at some point. But 
you can't tell me there's no value in that. Interestingly, when I did this preview show for Friday, there weren't great stream guys with 10 games on. With six games on on Saturday, there's a lot of really, really interesting guys who are widely available. If I look at my points league streamers for Yahoo points and ESPN points, Patrick Williams still sits at 45% rostered. He will have duds. We know this. But it's about the ratio. Previously, he'd be one good game, three or four duds. Now it's like three good games with one very good game in there and one dud. He just needs to be on rosters at this point. He should be on a 12-team roster. Maybe it changes when Zach Levine comes back, but how do we know that Zach Levine comes back? Ever. We don't. Williams needs to be rostered. Like these guys, Drummond, Caruso, Jones, Pat Williams on my streams of the day, to me, they are all must-roster 12-team league players. Must roster. For how long? I don't know, but they shouldn't be sitting on waiver wires. That is that is how I'm viewing them currently. Let's look, what's, let's look at what's on my radar. The first early game is in Utah, playing a matinee over in Salt Lake. Um, I read something about Utah. Not read. I watched something. My partner told me something about it. This is story time. Because Saturday, I don't have many shows to do here in Australia. Talking about Utah, and that I didn't know that LDS didn't drink coffee and they were addicted to soda. And there's all these soda, I've been to Utah, all these soda stores everywhere, so delicious. There's one of them, what's the other one? Swig. And that people go and hang out and drink flavored sodas all day. So instead of having coffee, they're just addicted to sugar and soda. Didn't know that. Anyway, when I was in Utah, I didn't see any so deliciouses there or any uh, swigs, but there you go. You learn something new that uh, LDS don't drink coffee, uh, can't have hot drinks, but they're addicted to soda. There you go. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Cool story, Josh. Miami and Utah. Tyler Hero has been playing at a really high level since he came back from injury. He has been the number one usage guy in nearly every game, and I think that doesn't change even if Butler plays. His def- defense remains obviously a problem, but he's just doing a lot for this team, and there is an outside... Well, probably not. I was going to say there's an outside chance he is the best fantasy player on this team. It's probably probably Bam. Jimmy sort of stepped behind them, but you could make an argument that Jimmy Bam and Hero could all be top 35 players this season. For the Jazz, I want to see what we're doing with Keontae George. I do think that the way that the injury sort of slowed his progress and the fact that they ran a three-point guard rotation last game and that they're starting Chris Dunn makes me push him more to be a uh, luxury stash. But if they make the switch and put George starting over Dunn, then I'm I'm back in on taking more of a uh, wide-ranging um, swing on him. I still like him, but it does hurt in a lot of categories. He's got a long way to go, and the injury did set him back, I think. In terms of streams, Kyle Lowry is still widely available. He's not awesome, we know this, but there's still a lot of value in using him and he's available in 55% plus of leagues. And Kelly Olenek, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know that he's going to start. He didn't last game, but they switch this shit up every game. So Olenek at least has some stream value when you're looking for assists out of a big man slot. Um, sorry for calling him a big man slot. Let's, oh, let's go to... Tell you about this, because today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, or sorry, FanDuel. And whenever I say FanDuel, the, uh, the auto transcription always thinks that I'm talking about you know precious gems. Anyway, that's fine, because as the weather gets colder, the offers on FanDuel, FanDuel, they get absolutely toasty red hot. In fact, can't touch them. That's how hot they are. You can use them, can't touch them. Don't want to get burned. So, new customers get $150 in bonus bets if you win a $5 money line bet. So, if you took a bet on the Celtics to win yesterday against the Pistons with your $5 money line, you were pretty nervous at halftime, but they pulled through and you got it. And then you got those $150 in bonus bets there ready to go. And then, when you're on FanDuel and using the app, which is easy, you can do parlays, um, over-unders, totals, player props, futures. I believe they took the season, the Pistons season win total off the board. Um, over there because, yeah. I think I think it goes underreported also for the Pistons. Sorry, Fangio, this is your ad. The Pistons won 17 games last season, which is historically bad as well. Like, I think it's the worst mark that we've had in a non-COVID-shortened season for like 10 years or equal worst mark since the Knicks back in 17, I think it was. Yeah, anyway. Beside the point, you can bet a lot of stuff over at Fangio. So go to Fangio.com slash locked on and get ready for NFL playoffs. Fangio's also an official partner of the NFL and don't forget to gamble responsibly. Let's roll through the next part of things and let's talk about your Detroit Pistons. They're taking on my Toronto Raptors, the battle of, I don't know, whatever's happening up north up there. 
It is a back-to-back for Toronto. We're obviously still watching the change in starting lineup, the fact that they took Malachi Flynn out of the rotation, what the hell is going on with Yucca Pertle. But in Detroit, I want to watch Jaden Ivey, who I do think you need to add. He is, again, it may not work out. We know this. There's inconsistency in rotations and production, but we want to get ahead of it. In most of your leagues, you cannot wait around for this stuff. It'd be ideal to be like, let's just wait and see. But that's more of a... If you're playing like a game, say like in Australia here, or you're playing Supercoach or AFL Fantasy or in England, or you're watching uh, the Premier League, and again, ready for another side tangent? Americans call it the Premier League. We call it Premier League. It's just a different pronunciation. It always sounds sounds different to me. Side note. If you're playing Fantasy Premier League, right, where you're in that situation where you can wait and then you can decide whether you're going to add this guy in because you're not competing against others to grab that player. So you can wait and say, well, now it's happened. Now I'll add him onto my team before his salary rises, blah, blah, blah. But in a competitive league situation like we play in fantasy where there's 11 other managers against you on a default sort of scenario, you can't really wait until that stuff happens. Until Let me just let him establish for five games or so. Then I'll see whether it makes sense. You've got to take the swings on it. You've got to see, well, and this is what we said about Ivy, who four, four weeks ago I said drop him because it was looking bad. He wasn't getting minutes. But that's also what you have to do. You've got to cut bait on things sometimes. And now he's back. And you add, you add ahead of time, which was about a week or two weeks ago that we decided on that. And then we see where it goes. So you, I don't think you've really got the luxury of waiting on stuff most of the time playing fantasy, especially on a situation like this. You just go ahead and do it. And then you move on if it doesn't work. Streamers, Gary Trent in Toronto. He is starting. We know what he is. Points three, sometimes steals, less so this season. He's actually upped his assist rate this season, which is also interesting. Is that a Darko effect? There's more ball movement in this offense, so watch that one. And then for the Pistons, it is the giggler himself, Alec Burks, who, again, not a great streamer, but he's getting more minutes than Nassar Thompson and got more minutes than Killian Hayes. He can score. He can hit threes. That's more of a deeper league one, but he's there. But he's there. The Knicks and the Pacers. The Knicks are on a back-to-back here. They are the most stable yet annoyingly inconsistent rotation in the NBA through four guys. Barrett, DiVincenzo, Hart, and Quickly. It's That's all we watch on them every time. Brunson and Randall are going to take every shot and play 37 minutes. Hartenstein's going to get no shots but play 38 minutes. And then it's those other four guys that are going to just rotate through. And we don't know how it's going to work. And it's going to be the same time in memoriam. It's always going to be the same. But the pace is what I want to see is what happens with Bruce Brown and also with Aaron Neesmith and then by you know, uh, association, Andrew Nampard. Neesmith has been very good. He's putting up numbers that are quite variable in defensive stats, which makes me think that he's not 100% a must roster guy, but he is rolling, so you do it. And the Bruce Brown absence helps. But if he's a 28 minute a night guy who relies solely on defensive stats as a six foot six, six foot five power forward, I'm probably going to be less interested in that maintaining long term. But again, do it. He's rolling pretty well now. In terms of streams, Josh Hart probably looks the best of the lower-owned Knicks, a bit of a higher than like a Dante DiVincenzo. And then you've got Sticks, who only played 25 minutes last game, Jalen Smith, but there's enough there. I don't think, again, this is a get-out-ahead-of-it one. And we talked about getting out ahead of it three, four days ago. You should still be getting out ahead of this with Jalen Smith and adding him and just getting some numbers and then moving on later on, if it doesn't work out, which it very well might not. The Lakers and the Wolves. The Battle of Minneapolis. D'Angelo Russell, who's like 24, 24, 24, 24, 17, 17. Oh, 29. All right, cool. So what is his actual bench role? Does Darvin Ham know what he's doing? Separate conversation. Where does Russell fit? Is he this 18-minute-a-night guy? Did he get his minutes bumped up because Austin Reeves got into early first-half foul trouble? Was it because Cam Reddish was out? How do we pass what Russell's role is? Again, the back-to-back on the weekend is fine. But if we see Reddish play and Reeves not in foul trouble and Russell plays 18 minutes a night... I don't know. How do you hold that? He's not going to be on this team all season. I'm very confident in that. One of the most confident players of being traded all season. It's him, who's I feel really confident about him being traded to where I don't know. The other guarantee, someone brought this up in my comments that I tweeted out today. The most guaranteed player to get traded this season is Kyrie Lewis in New Orleans. He has gone 100%, not a part of their plans. They're over the luxury tax and moving on from him puts them under the luxury tax. It is the most easiest. He will be traded. It won't really matter. Unless a team, oh, San Antonio, unless a team really needs a point guard and he finds his way into silly season minutes, he is 100% getting traded, Kyrie Lewis. D'Angelo Russell is not 100% getting traded, but we're talking 35, at least 40%, which for a trade is really high. Like I would put the odds of D'Angelo Russell getting traded higher than like Zach Levine, who's like actively working to get traded. I would say that's how I would view that for Russell. Anyway, 
For the Wolves, Jaden McDaniels, the role's there. But can we get any sort of reliability in offensive aggression or any chance of grabbing a board? We'll see. I still don't think that he's anything more than a back-end 12-team category guy. But you can have him because the role is relatively secure. In terms of streamers, I do like Torian Prince still. He's going to have to play a ton of minutes because no one can shoot in that starting lineup. He will have stinkers. We know this. We know what Torian Prince is. But he's worth streaming in. And then Kyle Anderson played more minutes again than Nas Reed last game. So it has flipped back towards Anderson. Whether it holds like that, I don't know. But we've seen Reed's production drop off. So you can go and drop him off. And Anderson's push up. And you don't need to add Kyle Anderson. But he's at least streamable in this situation. The Sixers and the Bulls, I don't know what to do with the Sixers. At this point, it's a back-to-back, so who knows what happens. But I do want to watch Ayo Sumo. And yesterday's recap, I forgot to mention Dasumu. He did put up some pretty good numbers. And I have been notoriously against the idea that Dasumu would develop into... Again, because this sort of stuff happens. And I always feel... like I don't, I don't necessarily like doing it, but... Well, no, I actually, I don't like doing it because I don't like to you know, talk about people having you know no upside. But I can't also sit here and say... Every player is the best. You're all winners. You're all going to be stars. Can't do that. So when I assume I had a little run as a rookie, I was like, okay, that, that's cool. I see him as nothing more than like a high level backup point guard. And then you get Cook for, I'll give him time. He's going to develop. He's awesome, blah, blah, blah. And so then naturally I've been sort of down on him as a player because being a role player is totally cool. Like it is absolutely necessary and useful and good. And so many players who make the all rookie first team, not even second team, not even top 10 picks, will end up as role players. That is the nature of the NBA. So as for Desumu, like he's settled into that. That is what he is. He's a backup. But at the moment, with players out, Vooch out and Levine out, he's playing 30 minutes a little bit more and he has upped his production. And I was probably, uh, not probably, I was definitely like lax in not talking about him. I don't think that he's a 12-team league uh, league guy, Desumu, but the way that he's producing at the moment is interesting enough for 14s, and he's at least onto the 12-team radar. Now, the difference there is that Caruso and Pat Williams are way ahead of him in terms of streaming priorities, as is Andre Drummond. So when you're looking at streaming off the Bulls, there are three guys who are available in over 50% of leagues that you add before him. But he is doing a little bit there. So in deeper formats, again, I was, I was uh, wrong to ignore him, and he has improved. In terms of streams, well, it's obviously Paul Reed. If Embiid is out, otherwise, you know, if Kelly Oubre is there, you try him. Otherwise, you get into the bullshit that is Patrick Beverly. In terms of the Bulls, well, I just mentioned it. Caruso, Drummond, if he's available, um, Pat Williams, and then you go down to Io DeSumo as a stream option. Dallas and Golden State. Derek Lively's last couple of games have not been particularly strong. I've heard of some people wanting to drop him, but interestingly, his roster percentage has actually gone back up, and he sits now at 65%, so at least some people are making the right move. Go and add him if he is available. The last couple of games were not very good from Derek Lively. Some foul trouble in there. He's going to have ups and downs, but he should not be on your waiver wire. While Trace Jackson Davis outplayed the centers again. Now, Kevon Looney has appeared on the injury report as, as ill just now. So there is a massive opportunity here for Jackson Davis. I've got Jackson Davis in some leagues. I did not drop him after those couple of bad performances. I still think that he does look better than Looney and Sharich most nights, but it's about finding the path from third string to at least you know, high-end backup. Hasn't happened yet, but I mean, how many times in the last two weeks have we seen Jackson Davis play more minutes than the two other centers? And that's a positive to me. So let's see how they use him here. Derek Jones, again, still widely available. Don't really get it. Him and Dante Exum are both excellent streams for Dallas. If Doncic did happen to be out, then we would look to Jaden Hardy also, but RIP in pieces your field goal percentage. And Jackson Davis is probably the Warriors stream, although Peyton will see exactly what happens with Gaz Payton. Just changing slightly up the chunk section of the show. I think hopefully this makes it a little bit more interesting. In the past, I would just put a name there and go, this is how many games the guy's got. If you don't know what a chunk is, cool. What we're talking about here is the next five days and looking at the quality game days in the next five days. So this is actually the same batch of quality game days that I did on yesterday's show because we're talking Saturday through to Wednesday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday are all streaming days. Wednesday is a 12-game day, so not a streaming day. So who's got the most quality games in the Saturday through Wednesday period? Nobody has more than two, but I wanted to highlight what days they have them because that might be important as well. So while Alex Caruso and Patrick Williams are probably the better options in terms of streaming, they should be rostered anyway, they play the Saturday low-volume day, and then they don't play again until Tuesday. So you miss out the Sunday, Monday. Whereas a Dante Exum and a Derek Jones and a Jalen Smith and an Aaron Neesmith, who all look really good from their streaming abilities, they play Saturday and Monday. So is Saturday, if you are in streaming and you're not wanting to hold Caruso and Williams and your roster's short enough, you don't have those spots, it's probably better 
to get a chunky guy like an Exum Jones, Smith, and Neesmith to get the Saturday-Monday quality game and then reset that position on Tuesday moving forward. I think that this change is a little bit more useful than what I was doing before. Let me know what you think. I also added in this little section, just to give you an idea, if you want to just stretch out past the five games, who's got a real big chunk coming up and how can that impact some things? So if we look at the next eight days, Saturday through Saturday, are there any teams that play five games? Because we know that five game weeks in the NBA aren't very common, but five games in eight days, which is not that different to a week, there are some of those teams and it's the Pacers, the Knicks and the Jazz. So when you're looking at a Neesmith, a Jalen Smith, maybe an Andrew Nempard, when you're looking at a DiVincenzo, a Josh Harden, Emmanuel Quickly, when you're looking at Kelly Linick, Keontae George, maybe Chris Dunn, in the next eight days, starting on Saturday, there is five games happening for these teams. Some will be on high volume days for sure, but we've already shown that the Pacers have the Saturday, Monday, and they've got five in eight. I think that should be useful for you guys, but I don't know. Let me know down in the comments. 10 team streams for Saturday. We're going to start with the big avocado himself, Andre Drummond, Isaiah Hartenstein, Alex Caruso, Brandon Pajemski, Patrick Williams and Derek Lively. These are all 65% rostered or below. Chuck Paul Reed in there if Joel Embiid is ruled out for Saturday's game. 12-team streamers. You look at the 10-team list first. You attack that. Then you get to this one. We go with Derek Jones, Dante Exum. Um, Exum, 20% rostered more than Derek Jones is a little surprising to me. And I am going to guess that's because he scored out of his brain against the Lakers. And that influenced a lot of people's decisions. That's my guess. Because I would say that their production has been relatively similar. They're in the same sort of role on the same team, but a 20% differential is wild, considering Jones has had value for longer than Exxon. Sticks sits on the 12-team stream list at 14% roster. Jalen Smith, we're going to stand by, by our man there. Aaron Neesmith at 22%. DiVincenzo and then Gaz Trent. So this is what I mean, like when I'm talking about some really interesting streaming options on a six-game day. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. Deeper leagues, we go to the Giggler, Alec Burks. We go to Ayo Dusumu at 6%. Chrissy Dunn at 7 um, Kevin Love, Rui Hachimura, and Jared Vanderbiltbar, who do have the advantage of the Saturday-Sunday back-to-back combo. And lastly, we look at points leagues. 45% rostered or below using Yahoo scoring. We go to Pat Williams, Alex Caruso, Jalen Smith, Dante Exum, Derek Jones, and Gary Trent. And that, guys, will do it for me today. Don't forget, if you are here, on YouTube, you can subscribe to the show. We're hitting Operation 80K. We are 9,000 subs away from it. Can we do it? I don't know. I hope so. Hit the thumbs up, be a double banger on audio, download, listen, let it play through, do it over here as well. And guys, I have to tell you that we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.